Welcome everybody. Uh, today we'll, we will be talking about the UTMB course preview and race strategy with Tim Tolfson and Petter Eng Engdahl. Um, so let's give them a warm welcome. So to get things started, uh, UTMB is obviously one of the most iconic courses, the World Series final. So to get things started, Tim, uh, Petter, um, kind of want to talk to you guys about how you go about breaking down the course. Um, what does it look like for you, Tim? You've been here before. Uh, Peter, it's your first time racing the course. So if you could, we'll start with Tim, but talk to us about how you break down the course and what that looks like for you. So you want, to, want me to tell him all my secrets first? Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. You know, UTMB, I, well, I, I think it's true for any hundred. Like, I have to look at in in small chunks. It's sort of overwhelming if you look at the course as 107 miles and 33,000 feet of climbing. So I really try to break it up into kind of five like distinguishable pieces. And for me, that looks like every time I see my crew. So we get to see our crew five times out there. And that's kind of, I have five individual races that I'm, I'm basically approaching. And, and throughout the day and night, it's just, okay, let's get to the crew. And that's one race. And then after I get there, then it's like, let's get to the crew. That's another race. Otherwise, it's just, it can be overwhelming. And I, I get, I start to have doubt that I would be able to finish the race. Yeah, for me, I have, yeah, it's my first 100 miles and the first uh, race over 10 hours. So uh, I've been thinking a lot like how I would like uh, sp split up the race and what an uh, intersection. So uh, I came to the conclusion to like put it into like these sections and not think them as races, but like sections where I have a certain mindset, more like, so for instance, from Chamonix to Contamin to have more like, a, this is kind of the warm up where I like run uh, with a bigger group and like uh, uh, run and enjoy and like try to first and all like realize I'm finally here and doing UTMB, a race I wanted to do for so many years. And then after Contamin, like going into the night, for me, that's a section where more like an adventure starts where I really like take care of my legs and my body and that's like first priority. And that section like goes all the way through the night to uh, Champelac. And then I think more like now is race time and now is uh, it's a section I know very, very well from racing UCC and CCC. So then it's more Series and you see the crew a little bit more and it becomes more a competitive uh, section of the course. So uh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear like how the more experienced uh, runners have uh, split up the course, uh, but uh, it's gonna be really interesting to see. More experience doesn't works. always mean wisdom. Oh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> awesome, so Tim, you, you know that you break down the course into five different sections. Um, basically based off each of one of your crew stations. Um, but if, I'm wondering if we can dig up just a little bit deeper and go into like what points of the race do you think are the most critical for you? Um, what areas do you want to minimize? Um, but I guess what I want to get into is like 100 miles is so long, you know, five sections is still long. Like get into like those, those, uh, like those key focus areas on the course for you. <sighs> I mean, there's so many, like it, like you said, hundred miles is long. I don't care who you are. Like some people minimize it. hundred miles is really far. Like it, uh, so just accomplishing that I think is a huge, huge, uh, just a huge, yeah, accomplishment for me, I'd say kind of similar to Petter. Like I really find that the crux on my individual like efforts out there tends to be the nighttime. And so as you enter into uh, for us, for, it basically goes dark right about Lake Contamine. So we get about three hours of running before, um, or we get there in you know, two and a half hours or so, and then, and then it becomes, you, we bust out the headlamps. And then it's like the next six hour section for me, I go through a lot of mental lows. And I think it coincides with my body wants to go to sleep. You know, it's kind of my normal circadian rhythm and I'm out there still pushing myself um, and the body's kind of starting to revolt. So in those moments, I really try to, like detach from what I'm doing and just like get out of my head and drop into my body and just kind of be present. Um, and I think that really helps where I can get through it. Even though I think of it in five sections, 
there are aid stations between there. So each of those are little checkpoints that I try to get to. So like I might see my crew at Lake Contamine, I won't see them till Cormier. So that's five and a half, six hours later. But I get to go over crew in Col de Penome and um, Lac Combal and all these other stations. And, and if I kind of set those as my little metrics of, hey, just get there, I feel like once I do, I feel accomplished. And there's almost this like little dopamine hit where I'm like, okay, I did something right. And then I just focus on the next section. Um, but it's, it's a little different every time. I, I go in with this plan and then every year something throws a wrench in it. And on the successful years, I troubleshoot in real time and make an adjustment. On the bad years, I kind of give up and I like, you know, have a little pity party that's like, hey, my, my goal, a goal isn't happening and then I don't do something about it. So even though I've done this, well, this is my eighth time, I, I've had plenty of mistakes out there. And uh, I think almost like what Petter's gonna be looking into, I think the naivety is kind of a, a blessing. You know, you don't really know how it's gonna feel at hour 11 or 12 or 13 or 20 or 21. <laughs> Hopefully not 30, but <clears throat> you know, not knowing I think is kind of a nice thing because I know the course so well, I have a hard time not gauging my performance based on historical data that's just printed in the back of my head. So like if I get to Cormier and I'm 30 minutes slower than my best year, I might panic. In reality, the course is different, the weather's different, we might consciously be going slower. So you just have to kind of shed that comparison game. Uh... Yeah, exactly. I feel like uh, for me, first and foremost, like being present in during the race is uh, like super important. Super important. So like uh, bad moments can come up anywhere, even though like I never done the night before, and that's maybe is the time where I feel most unsure, like where it's a really critical moment for me, or like after 100k because then I move into new territory. But my uh, I hoped to be like in such a good headspace so that I can be able to solve and problem solve. Like you said, like uh, mm -hmm. then is where you can perform the best and like put it into sections and like r really what do I need to do now to get to the next part of the course uh, as efficient and as fast as possible and still being able to uh, be in that, be present and be able to problem solve for the next section. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, when I also had the best performances, even in short races, is when you are present and when you can like think, okay, now I need to drink, now I need to uh, slow down a little bit, or now is the time to push and uh, then to hold back or, and stuff like that. As you get tired, do you find it harder to do that? Um, pr probably, yes. It definitely depends on like where I am. Uh, in general, in life, I think if it's like very, uh, uh, like I said, when you're in bad shape or you had uh, very stressed around or when you're not in a good headspace, then when you get tired, it's harder to uh, problem solve. But uh, when I'm in a good headspace around, then even though I, I get tired, I can just immediately think like, okay, this is what I'm not to do and not panic. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, cool. So you guys both brought up uh, running through the night uh, in a couple of your first uh, responses. I'm wondering, how do you, like, do you train yourself uh, to, to have sleep deprivation or do you do any specific training, like any training at night? I guess, how do you build the comfort of running over mountain passes in the middle of the night, uh, like without actually practicing it? Let's let the true mountain man talk, talk to this one. First. Yeah, I've done some like uh, sessions throughout the night uh, here in uh, Chamonix and uh, back home in Norway. So uh, not moving that fast, but being in very exposed environment and uh, so uh, and stuff like this. So um, it kind of becomes a race where you like really need to be very present and very uh, focused on what you do. Otherwise there can be consequences, but uh, 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 so that's how I have been working throughout the night, but uh, I haven't done any night runs the last uh, one and a half months because they, they also takes a lot of energy, you know, and uh, I've done them several times. Last thing was uh, uh, starting very early for a hike up Mont Blanc and then uh, coming down uh, uh, a little bit earlier in the morning. So. 
Um, and then, yeah, they take a lot of mental energy, so then I just needed to relax and get excited for the next one. Yeah. Cool. Tim? Yeah, I, I personally have never trained at night. The only time I've run through the night is during these races, um, and it's pretty much only European races. Uh, they tend to like to start at 6 p.m. or midnight or 11. Um, uh, but uh, I've made the decision not to just because historically I was working full time and I was juggling training and I felt like it was another stress that I just couldn't handle. Like it would compromise probably the entire week if I tried to run through the night and then it would impact my work the next day or my, my training. So I just chopped it up. It's like if I look at the entire training volume as just like time on feet, I'm getting plenty of time on my feet. And yeah, it's not at night, but I'm tired when I go for my evening run and it's probably mimicking it a little bit, but you don't get that like same preparation. And, and granted, my worst fallout here happened at night and like it, I had to abandon the race. So maybe I should have practiced it more, but I just kind of made that calculated decision that it wasn't worth the amount of energy that it might take from me. But I think that if you use it, like Petter said, using it specifically and intentionally periodically, it could be really helpful because when you're looking through that tunnel vision for eight to 10 hours, it kind of trips your mind out a bit. And like you, you have to recalibrate everything and, and you, you, do, you don't have your peripheral vision. So it feels like you're running really fast where you're maybe even going slower, but like it's just everything is different, the perspective. So I think exposing yourself to that at some point is probably good, but I wouldn't recommend most of us just go out and run the entire night, but maybe like, you know, practice running on the headlamp, you know, early in the morning or late at night, like a little bit. There's actually a cool study out there that says running at night lowers your RPE. Um, so maybe as you guys are out there this week and you, you can remember that when things get tough. Yeah. <laughs> but also for uh, me living in the south of Scan or north of Scandinavia, like. You don't get sun. <laughs> no, having head torch is like a uh, part of life up there. Yeah. So uh, uh, I've done lots of hours with head torch. I'm spoiled. I'm in California. <laughs> All we have is sunshine. Yeah, yeah. If you <laughs> oversleep, you miss the day. So let's, let's get back to the race strategy for this year's UTMB. Um, I guess we'll, we'll start with you, Tim. But um, looking at the course, breaking it down into five different sections, right, as you noted, um, like what is your strategy going into this year's event? This year has changed a bit, and I guess every time I've been out here, it's given me an opportunity to try something. And so I'd say this this round, uh, I'm really focusing on kind of selfishly internalizing my thoughts. Because in the past, as I've kind of let my mind get outside and like worry too much about what Petter's doing or what anyone else is, it's kind of like derailed my ability to perform and make those like decisions that are gonna benefit me, like what Petter was saying earlier. Um, so I've really tried to work on just kind of focusing internally on this one. And, and part of that is, I think, been a redefining of what I view success as out there. Like for many years, I thought success was winning the race. Like, and, and so I had years where I was off the podium and I couldn't handle it in the moment. So like everything else started deteriorating. Where in reality, like now my, definition of success and like this new framework that I have is, you know, getting the best out of myself out there. And I think if I do that, sure, it could be a win, but the best on that day, I could end up 30th. And if I know that I did give it my best, then I should be proud of that. And so that's something I'm really trying to focus on this year. And, and I think that's allowed me to shed all of those, you know, all that input that you can get at a chaotic event like this, where people put their expectations on you, or there's perceived internal pressure that we might might kind of make up ourselves, but trying to eliminate that so you can stay in the present moment, like Petter said. And, and I think executing that for me, it's you know letting people do what they do. So like if, if he takes off from the gun, which I mean, we actually do, you gotta do some strides for this like in prep because we'll get off the line at like five minute pace. And it, uh, if you're not like at that pace, you'll get trampled. Um, and so, but it's like 30 seconds to a minute and then you settle in. But our first mile will be six minutes, maybe 559, 558. Um, but it's really about like kind of let that out and then just settle into a rhythm that feels comfortable. My, my buddy, he's, he always like actually before my very first hundred, he said, lock into your forever pace. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I reminded myself of that this summer. And it's like, oh yeah, forever. Like if I, get to Lake Contamine and I feel like I couldn't do this forever, I'm going way too fast. So like I have to like dial it back and if you want to close strong, lock into that forever pace. So I, that's kind of what I'm going to be focused on. On that, do you do you go all 
uh, based off RPE, like subjective feelings, or are you using any metrics to make sure that you're at your all day pace? As a Koros ambassador, I use all of my metrics Thank perfectly. You. <laughs> um, no, I'm old school. I, I learned in college really how to tune into the internal cues for my coach, and that's kind of just carried me through because when I really started running, it was pre-GPS. Well, not pre, but like only like the cool rich kids had GPS watches, and so like we just had the old school Casios, and so I really learned to be in tune with just my breath, my you know perceived exertion, uh, different cues that my body was giving me. So I, I follow or pay attention to that a lot more. Um, but the one thing I will kind of look at is like, I do have global ideas of where I should be time-wise. So if like, if we hit Lake Contamine and it's two hours in, I know that we're, it's way too spicy. So like, you know, I'm gonna back off, but I probably will know that it's too spicy because my legs are gonna be burning and we're only two hours into the race. Gotcha, yeah. okay, better. For the shorter races I've been using like uh, different kind of metrics, but I also think I come from a little bit more old school type where you just, uh, or especially where you don't have time to look at your pace or your heart rate or whatever. So I try to go a lot by feeling and by breath and uh, proceed efforts, but I've learned in these uh, longer races that some tools are really, really good. So for CCC, for instance, I was looking a lot at the um, uh, vertical speed, like when I hit a big climb to like try to, okay, I just lock into 1200 meters per, per hour or when running in a, uh, <laughs> or when running uh, like downhill, the effort pace shouldn't be uh, faster than four minutes per K, like that's like fast enough. And uh, also in training, try to like practice with it, and so that after a while I don't have to look at the watch like all the time uh, to to see it. And then with heart rate, like I know that the body will just play tricks on you, and it can be caffeine, it can be uh, heat, it can be uh, whatever. So just trying to uh, look at the actual data and really listen to the body. I think that's a really good point where. We have tools that allow us to look at these things objectively, and you can't trust your own instincts necessarily and the feedback you're getting when you get deeper into a race. Like, your body's gonna start to lie to you, and your mind's gonna play tricks on you. So I think relying on that stuff is helpful, and I've talked to a lot of athletes, especially like if we think about Western states in a hot environment, it feels easy, but your heart rate could be through the roof, and it's hard to really gauge that. So I think actually like following the metrics can be really helpful. Both of you guys are focused really on getting as much as you can out of your own races, right? And, and you're being very polite, and I appreciate that. Um, but I want to dig a little bit deeper and, like, what do you think your strengths are relative to the field? And how does this course play out to where you can maximize that strength and gain time? For me, I feel like my strength is the uphills, uh, for sure, and uh, also some of the more uh, technical uh, parts because my because of my background in more sky running type of terrain and um, yeah playing around in very technical so I'm kind of looking forward to that sections and if I can like maybe uh, push a little bit harder to make a gap or like if I hold back and like it could be a section where I maybe recover and and stuff like this so I will try to really take uh, uh, advantage of that. Uh, what I feel like my um, my weaknesses maybe be, will be the maybe the lack of experience in uh, aid stations and in uh, uh, routine in the in the start. I think uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm very curious about the start of the race. Like how fast will they run? Will it feel very very fast or like? I, um, probably it will feel like it's very moving very, very slow. And that maybe like makes me run faster and like wanted to close the gap really easily, but I will just try to uh, relax a little bit and uh, yeah, uh, wait for later part of the race. So um, uh, yeah, it, it will be interesting to see like how my hiking really is because that was my 
uh, strength during CCC, I guess, uh, like just getting into big climbs and big hike uh, in uphill. I think if you feel good at the beginning, you should go really hard. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's never gone poorly for anyone. Oh, no? No. 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 Okay. Hell, it went no. Straight <laughs> yeah, on, straight like, off. Yeah, 4K or something yeah. <laughs> you went solo. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wire to wire. That's yes, it. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I'm the opposite of Petter. I, my historically weakness has been the uphills, and my strength is the downhills. And I prefer the running, and I despise the hiking. <laughs> and I think that's because I come from a track and field and a marathon background. And he's you know, a mountain athlete and a Nordic athlete, and he has a lot of that experience of just big days and technical stuff. Um, so I think it's fascinating, though, on these long ultras, all these worlds like collide, and they play to your different strengths, but it's not necessarily one is better than the other. Um, but uh, over the years, I've gotten better at the hiking, and I've, I've tried to you know, no longer look at it as a weakness. It's like an emerging strength. It's like, hey, I, I'm actually a good climber. Even if I'm not as good as Petter, I'm holding my own. And like, trying to focus on that has been helpful. But um, I, I just love the downhills. Um, I, I like to just let gravity take its, its toll and just send it. And, uh, um, and on a course like this, it's nice because the final 50K is basically, I view it as 5K up, 5K down, and repeat that three times. And you know, when you come off Le Flagier all the way into the, the town here, it's, if you have legs, it's awesome. If you don't, it's brutal, but it's a really fun descent. And actually, I don't know if you noticed, they cleaned the trail up. Like I oh, went yeah. out there, yeah. They like threw rocks out and they, they completely like did maintenance. It was way rockier yeah. a week ago. There, there's one section like uh, where you go in like one collar where there is like two a big rocks. Rock. Yes, two rocks. Right. Exactly, they removed that. I was, I was so mad. Happy. Are you were mad? <laughs> I, was I steeplechased that. I used to just yeah. hop over it. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, they're, they're buffing out the trail. I, I thought it may have been Terex that they were trying to make sure you guys were ready to break the course record. No, we, we still have it, so. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <true>. <laughs> do, you, do you actively like train the downhills or is that just the most enjoyable part of your trail running and that's really what you gravitate towards? Um, it's a combination. Like I, as you get into like training for the, the mountain events, you have to come back down unless you're using a gondola. So like inevitably you are gonna come downhill after you've gone up. I, my coach and I, a couple years ago, we did specifically start throwing in downhill intervals just to like season my quads even more. Cause there is a difference between like jogging downhill and running fast downhill. It all depends on also your efficiency. Like if you've lost your form, like you're gonna just like shred your legs um, and also you know, how technical it is, you know, but um, I do incorporate that, not a ton, like, I would say maybe once every two or three weeks, we have like a downhill focused interval day. Gotcha. And Petter, are you doing specific like hill repeats, intervals uphill? Like, how are you developing that strength to really give you that competitive edge on the field? Uh, yeah, like the most of my uh, endurance and the capacity training is in uphill and uh, Sometimes I put in some um, flatter intervals on the track or on the gravel road, but I would say like the main base is to like uh, work on my engine and work on my strength to like really feel comfortable in that section. And uh, just like Jim, I also uh, Tim, I put in some like speed in downhill. Uh, after it can either be like more focusing on the technical. Um, uh, aspect of like going in a really technical and just try to uh, jump and play and be fast and efficient there but then also like going on a gravel road and just you know it's gonna be hard and it's gonna just destroy your legs and it, those sessions aren't aren't really really f really fun really because it's just like trying to get the stride out and but you need them there's so so many sections on this course where it is really really runnable and where you just have to get the stride out and uh, being um, not being destroyed when coming down as for example like a runner like John Albon is probably the best in the world at and he is so good at those sections where it's not technical and just being able to run insanely fast and still being able to recover after so that was something I were specifically for, for CCC last year where I like, okay, if I'm going to I have to, I know I was stronger in the uphill than John, but uh, he, for some races he would close two minutes easily in, in a downhill. So 
needed to work on that. Uh, so I have um, definitely more confidence in that, but uh, I expect uh, Tim and a lot of uh, guys maybe uh, sending some of the downhills faster than me. So with the downhill train, that's really like uh, that's really interesting to me. Um, like, do you, do you guys make sure that you get enough downhill volume like per week, per per month leading in, or like at what point of the year do you start to like really specify like how much vert do I need to get ready for UTMB? Yeah, so my winters is mainly skiing, and uh, there we get a lot of elevation, and then we we're, we're more uh, more looking at the uphill of course but you do get some like really good strength in the legs from the downhill i feel a big difference from this year compared to last year L before i was mainly doing nordic skiing and you know you still on the flat or whatever you don't look at elevation so much but now i do mainly ski mountaineering so you you get a lot more elevation and then in february february mars i started to transition more to running to get some more specific running sec uh, sections in and work more specifically and but it also really depends on the terrain and whether in the environment you're at and like in uh, Romstal for example you can get elevation so easily but it's really hard to get the distance and really but here is quite easily to get both uh, so for me like since I arrived here to Chamonix in uh, June, I kind of have to reset and not really look at what I did uh, prior to coming here. So then it's like, okay, it's a new playground and, find, and uh, finding how my body reacts to the different environment and the different elevation and descending. I guess I work backwards. I, I choose my race, so UTMB, and then I think, like, I look at this course specifically and then try to extrapolate where I think or how much volume I think I need in training, and then kind of map that out. And in an ideal world, for me, it looks like maybe a 12-week block to get ready for something like UTMB. And like maybe those middle six weeks are where I'm doing the bulk of the training. It's like a three-week buildup, three-week taper, and a six-week in the middle. Um, and it, I don't focus on downhill vert in a volume metric, but it, I do just based on the fact that if I'm trying to get X amount of climbing on the ups, it's the same on the down. So, uh, cause I, I always finish where I started. Um, so, but I, I do think of it more as the, like how much vert am I getting in the week? Okay. So it does translate into the downhill. Um, this year was a little different for me. I, I uh, was dealing with a bum knee basically the entire, <laughs> the entire year. And so I did a lot of gravel cycling throughout July. And like, if you had asked me, if I was even gonna race UTMB in July, I would been, I would say yes, but I was lying because I was just hopeful it would work. And like, and then it kind of came around um, right about the time that I got here on August first. So I've had three really good weeks of training, and I feel like I'm like rounding into fitness, which is a nice place to be for a hundred versus like being one percent overtrained. It's probably a lot better to be ten percent undertrained than one percent over because I am definitely not cooked, and I've been cooked before a race like that, like UTMB, and it's not fun. Um, but uh, this block was a lot different. I basically had a very condensed, like, three-week training block for. But also, like, like all most of us, we have like a baseline fitness year-round. So, like, from gravel or from skiing or stair stepping or whatever it is, like, you're never not fit if you're doing something regularly. It's more like, okay, like, are your legs really ready for this? That's pretty cool. Uh, we get to see their data uh, when they give a when they give them uh, give us access to it. But seeing their level of base fitness is, is uh, quite exceptional. And then the, the peaks and valleys that associated with, with races is cool. So um, maybe we'll be able to do a, a write-up uh, featuring one of those sets. So a topic that uh, comes up quite a bit, especially with ultra racing, is nutrition. Um, over the course of 20, 21, 23, whatever, how many hours, like how do you guys stay on top of nutrition? What's that look like for you? Uh, yeah, how, how does it look like? when you're 20 hours into a race, what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> I should, should, I don't know. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's taking pointers, anyone? Yeah, exactly, like, uh, I don't know. I, I guess I would be very, very tired of sugar by that time and the uh, Morton gels and gummy bears. I would be, yeah, yeah. be craving croissants by that time, <laughs> for sure. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I don't really know. I have a plan, I have, like, talk to 
uh, a lot of more experienced uh, runner. We had a good chat during our run and uh, try to practice with it and also like see what am I craving after a long day out in the mountains and I realize oh, what I really crave is oat milk. And so then I'm like, oh, I've tried to implement that in, in my uh, training so that I uh, really want some oat milk at, uh, at some point. Uh, <laughs> I will not drink oat milk. Oh, no? <laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> I like it in more cortado, cortados, but yeah. not running. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also some other stuff like after CCC last year, the only thing I could eat was croissants. So maybe that's like uh, that's on the list for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, but otherwise, I've been working a lot with uh, uh, Morton, and that's the main nutrition I've been using for the last uh, uh, almost six years now. And uh, I really like it in both training and racing. So that is uh, uh, second nature to me. So that is my base, and then try to see like okay, what do I maybe want uh, here and there, and then. Also in certain um, A stations, I don't want too much like choices, you know, like sometimes you just want to go and you just like, uh, I expect when I come into Colmayer or to um, Champelac, my, my brain will not be uh, able to make a lot of decisions. So for in Colmayer, for example, I just, want one thing, one, one drink, and maybe something a little bit to grab. And that's the only thing I would like to, I don't have to do a lot of choices. Do you have a baseline number of calories that you need per hour or like number of ounces and liquids? Like, do you have that number in mind? Uh, so I'm more looking at uh, carbohydrates per hour and I will try to aim for a hundred okay. uh, per hour and roughly uh, 750 milliliters per hour if it's possible yeah awesome tim i think he makes a really good point yeah. like do you have a notepad i need to <laughs> yeah <laughs> um it, it changes and it, the the best like relatively speaking for any person will be those that make adjustments on the fly like you know his his oat milk is going to work great and then at mile uh, hour 16 it doesn't like and if he only stays with oat milk he's not going to get to the finish line the way he wants to. So like making that adjustment and being willing to be flexible is important. Um, I definitely have not done a good job on that. Sometimes I will have my stomach kind of go south and I can't take anything. And instead of trying something, I, just, I say I can't take anything. I don't try other things. I'm just like, oh, I can't take my one nutrition product I had. And, uh, and then of course, two hours later, I really bonk. Um, but I've started trying to drink a lot of my calories. Um, so I work with Goo Energy Labs and they have the Roctane drink mix and, and I have that every hour. And then I've liked mixing that with like a liquid gel. So it's about 350 calories an hour. And then like later stages, I try to get something in if that's not going, cause I know I need it. But I think Petter made a good point, like too many options. It, it's almost like the, any Californians or Americans would know, like, you know, we have this restaurant chain called In-N-Out. And like, you have three options, basically. And then you have the Cheesecake Factory. There, if you've ever seen that menu, it's like, it's a dictionary of choices. And like, you get overwhelmed, but you go to In-N-Out, you're like, oh, I have three choices. Or you go to Cheesecake Factory and it takes you an hour to decide. I think at aid stations, it is nice when you have like, okay, these are three options. And I'm gonna take one of them, make it quick and go. Like, don't get hung up on it. But um, yeah, I, I think being flexible with nutrition is paramount. It because uh, it works until it doesn't, and we all have probably experienced that. Like, and when it doesn't work, it really sucks <laughs> if you don't make a, an adjustment. Do you have a certain number of carbs or calories that you target per hour? Um, Three fifty divided by four. I don't know whatever that is. Like, I, I no, I, I just go on calories. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. But it, and I guess for actually. I'm a good Koros ambassador. I love my nutrition alert. Um, I, that's the only thing I actually have set on my watch is my watch will beep every 15 minutes during 100. I have no, um, no other like mile splits or anything else. I don't wanna know that stuff, but I wanna know every 15 minutes I hear that chime and that cues me if I am not cognizant to start eating. So like I, I basically just every 15 minutes I'm taking something in at minimum. So that's my nice little cue. Okay, so an ultra UTMB, like we have our race strategy, we have our course breakdown, we haven't talked about when plan A doesn't work and you need to use plan B. Plan B doesn't work, you gotta go to C, D, E, F. 
how do you guys handle adversity on course? And like, what's your process for making that decision to get you back on the right track? Um, so I'll let Tim start this one. Like when something, when something punches you in the face, like how do you calm yourself and, and make that decision going forward? I think experience helps. For anyone that's new to ultra running, the first time you kind of feel that real low moment where it feels impossible, it's easier to give in and just say, hey, crew, take me, take me home. Um, but once you've gone through that low point and you realize no moment lasts forever and something else will be on the other end, it's easier to convince yourself that, hey, I just need to get through this moment. And I have a little mantra I will cycle in my head. It's, um, it'll get worse before it gets better. And I will say that to myself. And actually, my first UTMB in 2016, I was audibly saying it out loud. And I think people thought I was weird because I was just like, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And they're like, what's wrong with this guy? Um, but something I've learned through the years is it's going to get worse. And then sometimes it actually gets worse. And it actually gets worse after that. And then worse again. But at some point, it does change. Like, it just no state lasts forever, which I think is the important part. Like, you can feel horrible, like absolutely terrible. And then five minutes later or 30 minutes later, you're going to feel different. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be better, but it's different. And I think different is good. And so that's what I chase. Like it, uh, And in those moments when like plan A isn't going well, I try to bring it back to like what I can control. So it would be, you know, kind of get out of my head because I know that's all this psychological just chaos, like a you know, go, like just a tornado going on. And I go, okay, where am I? What can I do? I can eat, I can drink, I can take steps forward. I can try to get this next aid station. And I think that's what Peter, Peter was saying earlier. Like if you bring it back to the moment and you're not worried about the future or the past, you can actually like move forward productively. And so that's what I try to do. And, and once that happens, you can start to see plan B, C, D, E, and F. But if you're so fixated on A, nothing else matters. All you see is plan A and it's disappearing. And then it's kind of like, why am I out here? When I talked about my race strategy before, like uh, I want to be in this kind of mind state during this, uh, uh, this section. So uh, my goal will be to try to be within this like kind of corridor or mindset, like in the start, not try to be too competitive. And during the night and the section there, like it will be an adventure and I will like just have to take uh, care of my uh, body and uh, like try to stay within that as possible and uh, like try to um, whenever I go out a little bit just uh, try to problem solve and remember like okay this is what I need to do to get back in that m mindset and if so if it's going too fast in in the start or if I'm too excited it's like okay calm down Peter it's, an, it's a long way to go. Um, or if I'm uh, feeling like uh, I'm bonking already at Col de Balm or whatever, like, okay, just try to calm down and uh, relax. Like, okay, it's, uh, uh, this is okay. It's a part of the adventure. What do I need to do to be able to continue and always try to solve it. So during my, during the low points, like always, uh, uh, look at it rationally and try to uh, see what do I can I do productively to get myself forward and to get into a good state again. So if it is to uh, take two caffeine gels or if it's uh, because that's what I really feel like I need like a, a shot of energy or I, I need to um, just stay with this guy to this uh, age station because there I can uh, take a little break or I know that the pace will slow down or whatever it can be. Yeah. I know that you also both do visualizations to understand when things go right, but also when things go wrong. So could you tell the audience and those at home basically like why visualizations or visualizing the race is important to you and how you go about it and specifically catered around UTMB? My visualizations start early in training. Um, I would say kind of almost every run I do at some point, I will think about the race I'm training for. I don't think about it the entire time because I think that can drain you. It can be too much. But just knowing that like this run, it has purpose towards a longer term goal. It, I like at least check in with that. But there are certain workouts or long runs that I will like specifically kind of try to recreate in my head what I might feel out there on the course. And that is easier done when you mim if you like 
plan your long run that mimics like a section of a course. So if you know like, hey, this, you know, over Grand Col Foray, it's gonna be a nice, you know, 2,400 foot climb over just a couple miles. If I can replicate that in training, once I hit that hill, I can start visualizing myself climbing up the coal. You know, it's gonna be morning, like sun's just gonna be, sun's not quite out, but we're almost, uh, almost at sunrise. And I can start to kind of almost visualize you know, my, what sights, smells, you know, sounds I might hear. And so I'll go through all that kind of stuff. Um, and then as we get closer to the actual race, I will at least once, maybe twice, just dedicate maybe half hour to an hour and tuck away into my room and like run through the entire course, like in my head. So I'll take half hour to an hour and just actually lay down and try to visualize a good, like my ideal state. And then something I just recently started doing was I do that same thing on when things don't go well. Because before I used to always just visualize the perfect. And so when it happened, it just felt normal. But then when the goal or the A goal didn't happen, I wasn't ready for you know the adversity that I was um, facing. And so I have started to visualize poor outcomes and what I will do in those moments and try to basically prepare and like sharpen those tools so that when it does go sideways, which it will, like, what am I going to do? Does that give you an extra sense of, like, control in the matter? Like, I feel like a lot of people get anxiety in races because something goes wrong, they lose control. But it sounds like what you're describing is, like, you regain control because you already process it before the race starts. So when that does happen, you're like, oh, yeah, like, okay, I've thought about this. I'm back in control. Yeah, I think it can create, like, a familiar space for yourself. Um, because there are a lot of things in ultra running we can't control. And when you fixate on the inability to control them, I think that's where there's this disconnect between your per perceived exertion and your effort and like the reality of what you're going through. And so I, I think it does kind of help prepare you for those moments. And, and it's almost like that radical acceptance of, okay, it's not going well and I don't like this and I don't have to like it, but what am I gonna do about it? Like, what am I gonna do next? Because we always have a decision to move forward and do something. It's, it's just not necessarily gonna be the ideal state that you'd visualized. Yeah, so I do pretty much the same of, uh, yes. You, you, yes. We should visualize I, together. Yes, exactly, like <laughs> go for a run together, just stay quiet and just like, <laughs> where are you at? Yeah. I'm <laughs> called the Yeah, you? You're ahead of me. <laughs> exactly, yeah, so. It is a lot of that from the training from already last year, you already start to have a small pictures in your head, like what will it uh, feel like there and how would it uh, um, uh, and uh, visualize some part of the race. For me, a lot of it is just like pre kind of predictions or dreams or really like, because um, um, I don't know how the body will feel like after 15, 20 hours so um, try to look at some videos like to try to okay this is like tough sections but um, for me it's have been more to look like try to remember both the good moments and the bad what have I done um, to get out of uh, or like how to problem solve that uh, uh, situation for example when I had a really, really bad moment at uh, um, uh, CCC or whatever race. Uh, it's been what did I do then proactively to get out of that and try to visualize those things and remember to uh, what to do so that I know if I get in the situation, okay, this is what I will, will do. So more visualizing the feeling and what to do. And then now when I see the course, I can go the last month, have gone through the course more and more uh, in my head and um, uh, try to remember so certain sections and certain trails and uh, uh, what I will do there. Um, but then it's also like practicing during training in both the good and the bad situations. And uh, yeah, like I said, like, uh, what can I do practically if I'm running out of water and I'm uh, somewhere and uh, it's a lot of A stations and I've done that in training and uh, have a quite calm in that like if something goes really wrong I know that I can move for a very very long time without water for example or in uh, uh, if it's really really cold a lot of the tr like try to practice every kind of scenario and conditions to to be ready for it so that I don't, so that the 
uh, I don't have to like uh, try to figure out what will happen. So you both you both seem uh, extremely ready, obviously from a physical confidence, mental perspective. So um, I think that's amazing. I guess the last question for me, and then I'll open it up to the the crowd after. But uh, the the last question would be what what makes this year success for you? Um, like what what do you want to take away from this year's event um, that will leave you like proud of of what you've achieved? I want him to start. All right, Peter. Yeah, uh, I'm just gonna say what he says. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is my first <laughs> race again, and so let's finish. Okay. Uh, my goal is to start in Chamonix and finish in Chamonix. Then I will be, <laughs> then I will be yeah. mostly happy. But uh, also, I want, uh, uh, I want to have a, a good experience and be able to, uh, uh, fight through all the lows and enjoy all the high moments and good. And I have a dream of one day winning UTMB and being, of, uh, being on the podium. But for, first and foremost, this year is, uh, uh, is a learning for me and it's uh, uh, going to be a good experience and then, then I will be happy. That's like a perfect representation of that beginner's mindset that I was speaking to earlier where, you know, the inexperience can be a gift. And that's what I said in 2016 before my first UTMB and I end up third because I went in honestly not trying to podium. I was trying to complete the loop and then it allowed me to get the best out of myself. Then after that success, it's like, oh, like you got to, you know, do more, do more. And then you kind of like start to like cloud your own head. And so I think I'm coming into it, even though like it's my eighth time, I kind of feel like an underdog again because I haven't finished this in six years. <laughs> so it's been a long time. I've dropped out a lot. And so I am trying to come back in with like, hey, let's finish in Chamonix after starting in Chamonix. And then like, if I'm able to do that, yeah, there's competitive like aspects that I want to execute on. But I think if I'm able to just like be present, be mindful and do what I have prepared without letting all these external things flood like into my thoughts, I probably am going to be more successful than if I get hung up on like, hey, I have to win this race or whatever that, you know, kind of goal that I have. I, I think it's, it's great to have those goals. Like Petter, myself, we want to win these events. And I think that's an important thing to like the chasing, but that can't be your why. Like it can't be the foundational drive behind what you're doing. I think it's a component, but it's not your why. That's awesome. Thank you guys. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I want to open it up to the, the crowd to see if we have any questions uh, for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so I've had like this process of thought lately that I think back to my first race that I ever did it was 100K. And I was like, wow, this is such a new experience for me. And then once I've like gone into other races, it's like, I feel like it's almost like, I know what, I've, I know what I'm getting into. So I was like, oh no, like this is, I know how hard it's going to be. Do you have similar thoughts to that, especially looking back on previous UTMBs where it's like your first one, it's like a new world. And now it's like you come back again and it's just like, I know what I'm getting myself back into. Yeah, and I think kind of combining things that Petter and I said earlier, when you have that curiosity in the unknown, it's easier to like forge ahead into the darkness because you don't know how bad it's going to suck. <laughs> and like... <laughs> And then after I've been through that, there have been times where, as he touched on, if you're, like, if you're just not in a good headspace personally, you're not ready to take on a task like that. And so I've hit that decision point, and I know how bad it's going to suck. And I'm like, I'm not ready for that. Like, and I, I just can't handle it. And so then you're more likely to give up on yourself. Like, the doubt is normal. No one goes through these events without doubting themselves. But it's, OK, what are you going to do with that doubt? Like, are you going to like entertain it? and let it stay over and just like, you know, become a resident in your, in your, in your, your head, or are you going to, you know, give it a glass of water and like tell it to get the hell out and you're just going to keep moving ahead. So I, I think it, it's, uh, it, but it doesn't have to be that way. It's just acknowledging it's like, Hey, those thoughts are automatic. You can't control them. And where are you going to redirect it? Yeah. Awesome. Anything to add? Better? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Great answer, Tim. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yep. Yep, in the back. Tim and Petter, thanks for being here. And it was really interesting. Tim, you mentioned um, in your presentation, if we arrive in two hours in Contamine, I know we are going really fast because, you know, 
the split times. I wonder, regarding your own race and regarding the rest of the field, would you do it arriving in two hours in company? And what makes your decision to go with the rest of the field to arrive in Contamin or run your own race and decide on that point when you're fresh and still warming up, I will not do it and I will do my own race? That's a really tough one. And I think probably I'd have to first answer the question, what is my goal on the day? If my goal is to win the race, I'm probably gonna have a really hard time not going to Lake Contamine in two hours with the rest of the pack. Um, if my goal is to you know, probably get the best out of myself or just close the loop, I would without a doubt let them go. But in the elite level of ultra running, it's getting harder and harder every year to let the pack go because basically the winner comes from the pack. You know, it's, we, it's very rare that you have someone that like comes up from behind. Like I think at UTMB, the last time that happened really was Ludo in 2016, he, he was in 50th-something place through Cormier, and he won the race. Like, he mentioned Pau Capel in 2019. From the start to the finish, he led the entire thing. Um, and I think we're seeing that more and more as the sport gets more competitive. So uh, personally, I'd have to make that judgment call of, is trying to win more important than trying to finish? And if that's the answer, if I answer yes, then I need to go with the, 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 basically the group and then hopefully make smart decisions in there. Like if I absolutely know it's way too fast, I'll back off, but I can't spot them too much distance. So it's kind of, kind of comes down to like, what am I looking for? Um, but in, in my most successful days out there, I let them go and have the confidence that they would come back to me. Um, even like everyone's probably run that first five mile stretch to Les Uches, or like you've seen it, it's just a rolling kind of dirt road. My very first two years, I actually hiked the little hills coming up at like two miles into the race. It's kind of ridiculous because like it's a very small hill, everyone's going slow. I could have run, but I kind of conscious is like, hey, I'm gonna walk right now or hike because I wanna save myself for 20 hours from now. And it paid off, but you know, maybe I spotted them a little too much. So it's always a give and a take. Better, how do you, how do you make that decision to let the field go or stay I, with uh, it? I, um, uh, I go a lot by feeling and also with uh, like um, some mm, metrics on the uh, on the watch really like uh, uh, I can for for a lot of races I can feel like okay this is going too fast for me like I want to have um, uh, like uh, you said before like this pace, uh, forever, pace. forever pace that is uh, something I've been practicing a lot in my career to just get into the uh, to the pace that I can start with and also have in the last climb. Uh, and uh, that's some of the best races I've done. I kept that um, st uh, strategy and where I can um, uh, either, it's been going really well from the start and I can be up in the lead group from the gun and to the finish line. Uh, or it is uh, sometimes like being way back in 20th or still being within contention, but then just by being able to run the last climb, for example, at Marathon du Mont Blanc, just by being able to run the last climb, I was able to go from 10th to podium. So it's, uh, um, I will try to stay calm and knowing my, uh, my pace and my capabilities and stay in the, mo the pace I know that I can do. Any final questions? Yep, question right here. Uh, thanks for your time and for being here. Um, I have a question to Tim, the DB for you have run CCC, so it's related to the course, and you've run it quite a few times now, so you seem to be a little bit of an expert. Um, what parts of the course are you particularly mindful of? Like, are there any climbs that are that have proven very difficult that you are a bit afraid of, maybe, and that you will pay extra? attention to and also where do you think the halfway point lies like apart from the actual halfway point? The halfway point is Champelac, <laughs> like which is what 120 kilometers in. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I do kind of feel that way though it's kind of like you need to get to Champelac and then there's a second race. It's the hardest 50k you'll ever do and to your first question 
points that are like you know kind of being really cognizant like cognizant of. I think early on, um, I find the climb out of Notre Dame like a challenge. You know, it's 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 the first proper steep climb, and you go over you know some rocky terrain and cross the creek multiple times, and they're just little areas that if you're getting kind of carried away, you can make mistakes. And so I think just being very like conscious of what you're doing in those moments, and it's nighttime, and so you're at a headlight headlamp for the first time. I, I think it's it's really important to kind of just be thoughtful with what you're doing, um, so that you don't make a careless mistake. Because by the time you get to you know let's say Cormier and it's still dark, you've had another six hours of practice of night running. But early on, it's kind of like like a baby deer on ice. You got to kind of just you know make good decisions. Um, the my crux every year it was true for CCC is. I call it the bovine climb. I don't know if that's the actual climb, but it's you know leaving Champelac and climbing up to that uh, bovine refuge. And I just find that one punishing for some reason. I I've never done it without at least what would that be like set 80 kilometers in my legs already. But it's it just punishes me every time. Like it's it's steep, it's rocky. If you hit it during the day, it's going to be exposed and hot. Um, and and I find that to yeah, be kind of the hardest part of the race. Yeah, I would think, uh, I don't know how it would be uh, like the first to uh, call my ear, but for me, a section I'm always thinking about is the uh, downhill from Col to La Folie and Champé before they climb, like how will I uh, feel there? Like how should I tackle that long downhill? And then the like is the pretty much 13, 15 kilometers in like a flat part. And that uh, that part will be uh, very interesting. And same for me, I also had like some bad moments up to bovine that that part is grueling. And it's some like uh, have to run in a stream for some time. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, so it's definitely sections where you like try to be more aware and uh, that I think the descent from Col de Ferret to La Folie is maybe more uh, important or like uh, uh, during CCC, for example, because it's quite early in the race. So it will def like, it's so long into the race. So you prob I probably have settled into a good pace and I know what my body is capable at that moment, but it's still such a critical point, I think, because a lot of people maybe just charge it because it's so runnable and you have a long flat section. And then then the big climbs where it's more like this up and down, up and down starts and you want to feel fresh for that. So Awesome. One final question. Yep, Sana. Um, for both of you guys who have raced, you know, CCC, UTMB, um, do you have any like recommendations or just any anything to share for first time runners who, you know, some of us, for me personally, it's taken me four years to get into CCC. Um, so I, you know, I may not be able to run this again. So do you have any, any tips and tricks or, you know, maybe there's a spot of the course where you say like it's the most beautiful spot or, or whatnot. Do you have anything to share for a first time runner? You run CCC? I'm running CCC. Yeah. Uh, like first of all, like you said, there's so few that get to r do this race and like enjoy it is <laughs> uh, like uh, from start to finish and remember that and be the purpose of why you're racing even for us and I feel like privileged to to be here on the start line after like I've been working towards it so uh, that is like definitely just huge and uh, then um, uh, I think uh, uh, yeah, the, the first climb up, out of Colmayer and then running on the ridge, like looking up and see, see the views of Mont Blanc is just, uh, it's just breathtaking. So enjoy the moments and enjoy the mountains. And then it, uh, uh, but also like take care of your body and make the experience as good as you want. Uh, and uh, don't go too fast down Col de Ferret. <laughs> and there's a lot of small streams uh, along the path, so be like flexible and like try to refill bottles and in fountains and the streams. And I think he makes a really good point that you know really cherish the privilege of being out there. It's uh, it can 
take four years, it can take people longer, and there's no guarantee you'll be back. And I think the mistake a lot of us make is just assuming that, oh, if it doesn't go well this year, I'll do it next time, or I'll get back, but there's no guarantee. So I think kind of leaning into that impermanence of this is a gift and cherish it. And when it's terrible and when you're not having fun, you know, remind yourself that like this is a gift and lean into that impermanence. And I think that's something that, you know, you'll never get back. So try to really soak it in the good and the bad and don't give up on yourself because we're all capable of getting to that finish line and you just have to give yourself a chance. So with that, we wish you uh, best of luck this week uh, in the racing. We'll be tracking and following along as, as I'm sure everybody else will here, but um, let's give him one more round of applause and, and show them our...